Please consider supporting Black Women United YEG for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. You can learn more about them at bwunited.ca. Uh, they are always looking for donations and volunteers. So please, again, support Black Women United YEG for the protection and advancement of black women and girls in Alberta. Again, that website is bwunited.ca. This is Dmitry Samarov from Chicago, Illinois. And I love listening to Vish Khanna's creative control because whether he's talking to a favorite musician or actor of mine or someone I've never heard of, it's as if he's introducing me to a new friend. And the way things are going, couldn't you use a new friend? Listen now. To make your flexible monthly donation to Creative Control, please visit patreon.com slash creative control today. Ian Mackay is a musician, songwriter, and producer who co-founded Discord Records, which is based in Washington, D.C., well known for his role in bands like the Teen Idols, Minor Threat, Embrace, Fugazi, and The Evens. Mackay recently formed Kariki, a new band with Amy Farina and Joe Lally, and they released an excellent self-titled album earlier this year. Mackay also continues to tend to Discord Records, which he has overseen since its inception in December of 1980. Having made note of this 40th anniversary milestone, I contacted Ian about having a chat about Discord's current status, and we wound up covering that, as well as his memories of Fugazi's first show in Guelph in 1989, maps and the importance of taking notes, just generally taking notes, songwriting in Kariki, the Fugazi A to Z podcast, which examines every single song the band has written, the Fugazi Live series, future plans, and much more. A part of the Entertainment One Network, with the support of listeners like you, who follow and subscribe to this podcast and spread the word about it, and make flexible monthly donations at patreon.com slash creative control, and Massey Hall's concert film series, live at masseyhall.com, where you can stream dozens of 30-minute films for free, including performances by past podcast guests like Great Lake Swimmers. Plus, in-kind support from Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf, and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton. This is the 583rd episode of Creative Control, featuring the thoughtful and talented Ian Mackay, with your host, me, Vish Khanna. Uh, Ian, it is uh, Friday, November 27th at uh, 127 uh, my time. It is uh, lovely to see you and speak with you again. Uh, uh, thank you for this time. Uh, for those listening, I always ask my guests where in the world they are. I happen to know this information, but I'm going to ask it nonetheless. Ian, where in the world are you today? I'm in at the Discord House. I'm in the office of Discord House, which is located in Arlington, Virginia, which is just across the Potomac River from Washington, D.C., where I reside. Nice. Uh, Dis yeah, Discord House, actually, on October 1st, so just a couple of months ago, uh, we just I just marked the 39th year of this house. Wow. You know, yeah, uh, we moved a bunch of punk kids. You know, we left our houses and moved into Discord on October 1st, 1981. And then we rented for 14 years, and I bought it, or 13 years, and I bought it in 1994. Uh, I ended up living here for 21 years. I moved out in 2003, at the end of 2003, but I own it and I still work here. I still have all the, you know, the Discord stuff all works. I come out of this house. So 
Nice. What, what exactly prompted you to move out of the house? I've never, I mean, people move on, but what was it exactly? Well, primarily, I think that because Discord House within my and sort of the world I occupy, people who are familiar with my work or in the punk scene or whatever, they quite often are familiar with Discord House. It's a fairly well-known spot. And so quite often when people would come to visit, they it would I would end up sort of giving them a tour, which I enjoy doing, but it was a house that people were aware of. So it was like living in a museum. And I also started to feel like a docent in my own house. <laughs> um, so it's strange because you'd be like saying like, oh, well, this, I'd say, oh, that's where, like that's the, pra- the room you practice in, or that's the porch where the photo is taken, or you know that's the office, whatever. It is. But it's also like it's it's where I like my life happens, and it just at some point I felt like I probably need to get it out of the house. I need to live somewhere else. Although I must say I love it here, you know I do yeah. love it. Yeah. But yeah. also a- Amy and Amy and I were, you know, we were together, and I think we wanted to sort of just yeah you know, have our own home, and as opposed to having her move into the house. Seem like why not get another house? Yeah, no, that it all makes yeah. sense. That makes sense to me. How has your relationship to the city kind of changed? Because you've been there. People know Washington. For me, when I watch the news and Washington D.C. is in the news, you know, I'm sure that conjures different things for different people. It's a seat of power, of course, as a city. For me, I think, oh, Discord. I think Ian. I think you know Fugazi, minor threat, whatever. What about you? Uh, how has your relationship with just being in D.C. kind of changed, if it has at all? Has it changed, I guess, is my question. Well, I'm a fifth-generation Washingtonian. I've lived here my entire life. I'm 58. I'll be 59 in April. So it was a very strange nine-month interruption. My father had a fellowship at Stanford University in 1974. So I took, went to seventh grade at a place called Terman Junior High School in Palo Alto, California. Oh. But otherwise, every pretty much, you know, my entire life has been here in this within like sort of the, the or in the DC area. Arlington is in Virginia. But I mean, ironically, Arlington used to be part of Washington. But then it was, you know, originally, and then it was given back to Virginia. So it's really nestled right in. Yeah. The, is, I mean, it is in the district, really. It's in the cent- the little diamond that would be the district. But my relationship with D.C., I'm not a, I don't come from government. Like, my family are not government workers. My dad was a newspaper person. Like, he was a writer. And my mom's, they're both writers. And their their parents were writers and newspaper people and magazine writers. And I don't really, didn't pay much attention. Like, I'm certainly aware of what's going on downtown. But if you grew up in a city like Washington, and I imagine it's the same for say Ottawa or any capital city that yeah. you're, it becomes really clear that, that the government is a giant business and that like all businesses, self-preservation is their main aim um, about making money and keeping the power and jobs. And that's what goes on here. So I didn't never, I've always had a sort of, yeah, I'm, I'm ambivalent about the government. I find it, I actually find like, it's not, I don't live in the federal city. I live in the city. I live in Washington, yeah, D.C. Right. And it, of course it's evolved. I mean, I think that for anybody who's lived anywhere for 50 plus years, you know, where did you grow up? I grew up in Cambridge, Ontario, which is about a half an hour from Guelph, uh, where I, right. I lived most of my life in Guelph. To be honest, I thought of you, a little bit when my family and I recently moved to Edmonton, Alberta. So right across the country, basically. Yeah. And yeah, I thought yeah. I thought of you because I associated myself with Guelph. And I had I told some friends from out of town that I was moving and they said, man, I can't imagine Guelph without you there. And I was, you know, it was a nice thing to hear. But it kind of got to me. And I thought of you because I think I've talked to you over the years and you've said, you know, or maybe you've said it to others. I live in Washington, D.C. All these government people come and go. It's a stop in their life. This is our right. city. This is my city. Right. And I right. and that resonated with me quite a bit. I was conflicted. Like Guelph felt like my city, like uh, not mine in a selfish way, but that I associated myself. All my changes kind of came there. So I, I, I asked this question because I wonder, have you ever thought about moving? Was, were you ever close to leaving and, and being driven out by all the, the bullshit that, that goes on there? Um, has that ever occurred to you? Were you driven out? No, 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 no. I wasn't. My wife's family is from here. No, uh, I wasn't. I that. Yeah, yeah. My here's, w- the, here's, what, here's what I can say about that. No, the answer is, I mean, I when I first began to tour, like minor threat, not so much. In minor threat, I was really, 
so focused on what was happening in DC. Um, and I just, you know, touring was agonizing because you didn't want to miss any shows. Yeah. Like early on the gigs here in Washington, it was unbearable to miss a show. Like a band like Rights of Spring, who, you know, were the, for me, one of the greatest bands that ever existed live. They're just so amazing. And I think they played, I think they played like 17 shows maybe or not many. And I saw all but two, I, I believe. I think I missed the one in Detroit. They went and played with Sonic Youth up there. I didn't see that show. And then there was another show. And I was in London. I was in England at the time. And I actually called them and said, I'm sorry, I'm not there. So <laughs> you never wanted to miss a gig. And so yeah. touring meant to tour. We were in Meyer Threat. When you toured, you're missing all these gigs and at home, all these really Im important gigs. Hold on. Yeah. Let me stop the noise. Hey, Joe. Hey, good. I'm in the middle of an interview. Can I call you back? You got something quick. All right. I'll, I'll call you right back. Bye bye. Joe Lally. Oh, Joe. I miss Joe. I saw Joe. Oh, that, hold on. I'm trying to think of when I. That was that was Joe checking in. Joe. Um, Joe. Uh, I saw Joe a couple of years ago when uh, Mesthetics played Toronto. It was the last time I saw him. I miss Joe. Yep. I, I miss. Uh, I miss live yep. music. I miss seeing <laughs> Brendan and Joe play. Anyway, sorry. So you yeah. were that's ironic. You were just talking about uh, gigs. So uh, yeah. So anyway, um, but then when Fugazi started to tour, it was so amazing. We'd go to a town. I think God, this town is great. You know, I'd love to spend six months here. Not move there, but spend six months. But at some point, I went to so many cities, and there are so many great cities. I didn't have enough six months to do that. Mm. You know, actually, I was just typing up my 1989 journals. In which, by the way, we play our first show in Guelph. That's right, Aaron Richards. Yeah, Aaron Richards and Phil yeah, Hunter. Aaron they Richard, set it up. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they did. It was. Uh, let me see. I think it was on. Is that the yeah, loft? It was on the loft in Guelph. Nine, it was uh, September thirtieth, nineteen eighty nine. It says. Uh, I said that uh, this is what I, I said. Uh, we drove. We left for Ottawa. Uh, I think around twelve thirty or one. It's a boring drive. <laughs> Toronto was a bit madcap. Where we passed through, but Guelph is a small college town set away from the main highway got a bit lost trying to find the loft where we're playing arrive late and load in a bunch of the meanest looking skinheads i've seen in a while oh yeah out. yep we go to a chilean joint to get dinner not only does it take forever to get our food but the restaurant screws up twice my meal <laughs> first putting sour cream on it and then on the replacement burrito putting cheese on it <laughs> so i ended up just giving the burrito to aaron who's one of the kids putting on the show <laughs> I watched some of the first band, Floor Noise. Floor a, noise. a pin pal of mine, Michael Aline from Kitchener, plays guitar. Ah. Go to a, an Asian joint to get vegetables and, eat, and rice to eat, but I'm not feeling very well. Rise are playing when I get back, but I can't concentrate on their set. The skinheads are hot and bothered by something or other. They demand their money back and all storm off for more foolish pastures. Shades Apart from New Jersey are next. Power Pop played by... Um, like pretty cool dudes said, I'm not really up for the show, but things go great. Once we hit the stage, had another shitty PA, but a really responsive <laughs> crowd. No problems at all. <laughs> I broke a few strings, do some interviews afterwards, go to Phil's house to sleep. Shades apart, come over and stay as well. Said we order pizza and talk. The pizza guy tries to charge 57 Canadian for three pies. <laughs> He's very and he's very pushy about it when he questioned the figure because it should have been thirty seven dollars and he knew it. And then it says, turned out the skinheads got the shit beat out of him by some heavy metal kids in an arcade. Oh well, what goes around? Dot, dot, dot. Anyway. Wow, that's amazing. So did you? What, yeah. what was the first of all? Nice to hear about Guelph making me nostalgic. Uh, and Aaron and I uh, r sort of recently reconnected, and so he was uh, just on the show a little while back. So it was nice and. He texts me all sorts of funny things, but he introduced me to you in Detroit in 1998 uh, at the State Theater with Shellac and Blonde Redhead. And I always remember it because we walked in and you were like the first person we saw, like kind of in the backstage area. And you went, hey, you guys the Canadians? And I was like, yes, we are. Yeah, <laughs> It's just kind of funny. Anyway, yeah. that that is great. What is the occasion for you to, uh, to type up your, your diaries there? And uh, is this... Uh, is this some? Is, do you, do you have notes on all the shows you played, or is that I? I'm guessing you um, do. No, 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 no okay. I don't. Um, when I was in Meyer Threat, I kept a very, very, very rudimentary journal about the tours. 
And then Minor Threat broke up. And I was like, I'm sad that I don't have more. I didn't jot down more things. So then, you know, Cynthia Connolly, who I was going out with at the time, she had given me a journal. So you should write down what you did on your tour. This is 1982. So I wrote it. I did keep that journal. As I said, though, it was really pretty thread, threadbare. Then I started to keep a more, I started jur- writing my journal more often and really getting to the habit of it. In 1983, I kept a few notes. That was my thread still. 84, I started to really write. Then 85, I was really writing pretty much every day. Hmm. And I did that pretty consistently into the early 90s. Um, when Fugazi started playing, um, when well, Brace never toured, so there wasn't any real, nothing really to write about. Yeah. Um, we only, and I think we only played 11 shows. But when Fugazi started touring, I really thought, like, I'm going to keep a really dedicated journal about Fugazi. So I actually got a separate journal book. And every gig we played, I wrote extensively about who was at the show, things I just wrote about my impression to the show. I just thought that would be interesting. Mm-hmm. And um, so that was in, we started playing September of 1987. In the summer of 1988, I went to go see the Rollins Band at the 930 Club. And when I came out of the show, I noticed that the ashtray in my car was open um, and someone had been rooting around in my car. And I reached down underneath my seat for my book bag and it was gone. Oh, no. And in my book bag hmm. was two journals. Hmm. One was my personal journal, which luckily I was using thinner volume. So I had, had two two books for one year as opposed to just one. So this would have been July, I think. So I, I'm... I, or June of, of 1988. So I had just started a new journal book. So I only lost like a week. And thankfully the first six months were residing in a box in my room. Hmm. So the, that journal was gone. I lost a week, but the Fugazi journal was gone and that oh. had everything in it. So that was really, that was pretty um, disappointing. And I spent, I mean, I didn't get, I wasn't upset. I just was like, Oh man, the person who stole this does not care. Yeah. You know, and I immediately, I spent hours downtown Washington, like two, three, four in the morning, going to all the trash and lifting all the sewer lids. Uh. Like I was looking in the sewer, but I never found it. Um, but I did keep, I just kept a journal and for a while. And I stopped and I said, at some point it became insane keeping a journal, especially when I was writing things like I was, I was writing that I was writing. It just started to feel crazy. Like the documentation mm. was starting to get in the way. Mm. But I have to say that the bits like that thing, like I just happened to type up that Guelph thing the other day. So it was just funny when you mentioned Guelph. I'm like, oh, I just was <laughs> writing that. And now then you can say to me, well, why were you writing it? Well, because, because I could tell you about it. That's why. That oh. was, that's the reason. That is exactly why I'm people say, why are you typing this? Are you working on a book? The answer is no, I'm not working on it. It's not for a book. It is because it's a way of. Um, is mitigating the right word? I'm not sure if it's the right word. What's the word I'm looking for? It's a way of like, I have all these handwritten journals. So in a way I'm by typing up the journals is giving me an opportunity to kind of, it was a resource in a way, but it gives me an opportunity to kind of go through these experiences. I have a pretty good memory yeah. to begin with, yeah. but it's very interesting to see where my memories veer away from the way I reported at the time. It's also interesting to see when, I was like, wow, I really, I really, that's the way I remember it. Now, my mom once said to me, you know, she was a very serious journalist. I mean, and I mean, keeping journals in that sense. When she died in 2004, she left us 60 years of journals. Wow. Uh, And then she was, my mother was a phenomenal writer. And her journals were, they're like books. I mean, they're incredible narratives and, and great observations and, She's just brilliant. And um, she used to encourage me to write it down. She'd say, you should write it down because then you don't have to remember it, which that, is true. That's true. It is absolutely true. true. Yeah. The problem and the thing is, and what, here's why it's true, because if you write it down, your brain no longer feels it doesn't have to remember it anymore because you have a record of it somewhere. Now, ironically, and this is the true irony of the situation. When you write something down, you are creating a neural path. So, for instance, some years ago, this is an example of that. Years ago, I went going up to a do a talk at University of Connecticut. And I've been to University of Connecticut many times, certainly driven 
up the highway up that, you know, I've done drift, making that drive many times. Yeah. And I had taken a train to New Haven and rented a car and was well, driving up the highway. And this is when MapQuest was the program online that you would use to get directions. Sure. And I, I don't, and still, I didn't, and I still don't use GPS. I just, you know, I would just print the directions out. Now, historically, I would call people to get directions, but people would say, well, just get them off the computer. So I just print out the directions. <laughs> and I'm driving up the highway, and I had a moment. It was I remember it was dark. It was a winter. It was in the early evening. It was raining. But I had a sense of dislocation or disorientation that was really it was weird for me. It was very – I felt – it was very uncomfortable for me, this feeling. Because usually I have a really clear sense of where I am in a general sense, not like, you know, I just have a sense of where I am in my picture of the, where the, what's going on that day. And I realized that I had not engaged with the directions at all. I had just printed it out. Now, if I, let's say in, when I was trying to get to the loft, for instance, I would have called Aaron you know, and say, how do I get there? And he'd say, go down here, take a right, but you know, whatever it is, you know, you get the direction. As you write, you draw, there's a, you're actually drawing a map in your brain. Like you have a visualization, at least I should say I do. By printing it out, it skips that altogether. So when you write down the direction, you're actually, in my mind, when I write them down, I'm, I'm drawing a path in my brain. So now when I go somewhere, I'll look up the directions on the computer because nobody knows how to tell you how to get anywhere anymore. That's true. Um, but I just write down the directions. And that process of writing it down means that when I'm driving, I'm not I'm not beholden to something telling me, you have to slow down and make a right here. I know that the right is coming up. I've already got it. I may not know exactly, but I have a general sense of the path. This is another thing that's kind of interesting on that same front, which is I think that many people today – see themselves as a, as a fixed location in the world moving around them. But I still think in terms of me being a point that moves on a map, like right. I see a map, right? The map isn't moving around me. Like I'm the dot that moves on the map. So right. the rights and lefts have a different kind of, but I think in many, because of GPS, I think people really, it's harder for them to see themselves on a map. I think they see themselves, they see the map moving around them. As you're speaking, I, I the corollary I would draw is that I've had a thing in recent years where it used to be if you were, say, upset. Let's say, let's the example is you're upset with someone. And in the heat of a moment, you might write them an email uh, to express yourself or a letter, whatever it is. What I've been doing in recent years is I write the draft of the message <laughs> and I store it and then I think about it and then... Odds are I don't send it. I got it out of my system. I right, wrote it down or expressed myself. I know you're talking about navigational information. Do you see a correlation as a songwriter between idea in my head, concept in my head of something I want to express, writing down, writing a song? Do you see any correlation between the map analogy you've drawn and the notion of I have something to say or or express or that I've been processing. And once I write it down, I've learned something about it. I've learned something about me. Do you have that at all? Uh, not in the way that I think you're talking about. Music is a very different situation for me. Writing songs. One thing you said, which is, does resonate with me is that once I write a song, I learn something more about the song. But first of all, I don't write music at all. I can't write, I don't read or write music. So that's always tactile. It's like ears and sure. hands. I, I guess um, I was referring more to the lyrics. The lyrics, yeah, right. Yeah. In recent years, lyrics always come last for me. Almost always. Like 98% always. And hmm. that's different than what you used to do? I th I think so. It's hard to say. I, I, I don't really remember. I think that there was times where, like in Meyer Threat, there was a form that was pretty... I would just sit there and write down like they're almost like raps. Yeah, <laughs> they are. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so I think that, uh, I don't know. I, what I can say starting in Fugazi songwriting shifted where 
we would just play music, 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 music. And then I would, them, D or I or Joe would then say, okay, well, I'm trying to put some words on this instrumental. Like yeah. all of our songs were instrumentals really yeah. with then words applied. And that's still kind of the case in Kariki. Like we have these musical ideas. Like I write, those things come to me pretty regularly. And I just have, I have lots, you know, we, there's a lots of musical ideas and and I know what the song is about, but I literally cannot put it into words. I mean, literally it, it's, cannot put it into words. It's, it's like, yeah. I know the song's about. So then to make the song public or to share it with people, um, I feel like I, I want to put words on it, but the words that I put on the song aren't necessarily exactly what the song is about. Rather, they have to carry some importance that signifies some kind of um, something consistent, like another an issue or a thought that is somehow as important as whatever the song. But I, it's too esoteric to even yeah. get into. I don't really know how to put it. In. I do. It's I. This is just my more recent thinking about it because I, you know, over the last fifteen or twenty years, I mean, I, I don't know how many songs I've written that never were finished mm -hmm. because the words just never showed up. It's just the songs where the words show up. I'm like, okay, like, well, that song can come out now. But the rest of the songs still exist in my back pocket. Do you mean you'd start a lyrical idea and not see it through? Or do you mean you just didn't put words to instrumental music? When you say it's not finished, I just want to... Uh, it means that, well, in some cases, it's just music that never I never figured out what to sing yeah. at all. Yeah. In some cases... I have a chorus, but I never could get the verses. Yeah. Some cases I have verses, but not a chorus. I don't know, but I just, yeah. I just never finished. I, but the thing is, I'm in no hurry. So a song like, for instance, Clean Kill, which is the first song on the Kariki record. Yeah. I think that original, the riff for that song was written in probably 2014. Is that even, the chorus, that's Evans era maybe? Or is it? Well, e it was post Evans. Okay. It was after... Amy and I played our last like even show in the fall of 2003. And then we took a break from playing. And then, I mean, we didn't do, we never played any more gigs, but then we started to play with just friends on bass. I was still playing baritone guitar. Yeah. And we played with this, with Mark Cisneros, who you might know he's in this band hammered holes yep. and played in death, um, death fix. And he's a brilliant musician. So he would come play with us and, Brian Baker played with us once. We just have a, we just play with the idea was just to play music. And mm -hmm. it was interesting to play as a three piece um, because it was a, um, it was a different kind of conversation than a two piece, but people kept saying, boy, shouldn't you be playing music? I, I am playing music. I'm just playing in the basement, you know, two, three, four times a week. We were just playing. Oh, everything, so you're, that, everything you're just referring to is, is in the basement. These weren't necessarily public uh, appearance. All the, the base. No, the, none of them are. None of them are none public. Of them are okay. public. Yeah. Right. We didn't play any shows at all until Kariki. Well, was actually in the beginning, it was just called, it was had no name. It was just Ian, Joe and Amy. We yeah. played in 2018. Yeah. So it took us five years to pretty much. I mean, there was one, I think Amy and I did maybe in 20, possibly in 2017, Amy and I, did two songs at Fort Reno. We did a an even song, I think. Oh, yeah, I think we did even song, and we and we did a lungfish cut song. Just the two of us, but she wasn't drumming; she was just singing. Oh, um, that was cool. But uh, <laughs> but 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 there was no other music. Like it wasn't until we played with Joe in, in the fall of 2018 that we went back to the stage. But I never we never stopped playing music. We yeah. just play music. We just all we just always play music. So there's a lot. So a song like Clean Kill, I'm pretty sure that riff and the chorus was started in 2014. So it took us or it took me four years to get the words sorted out. You know, but I'm it, in no hurry. I don't care. Yeah, it didn't bother me. You know. Uh, yeah, I just want to follow up on something because you you mentioned Brian Baker from Minor Threat and you mentioned Joe Lally from Fugazi playing with you and Amy. And it has occurred to me that like, over the years, I've observed that sometimes when you or members of Fugazi or Minor Threat do anything together, it often makes the news or the music news. 
Like there's a bit of mania over kernels of information about these things and it creates like a fair amount of excitement. And I just wonder if you have any perspective on why that seems to occur because it's just fascinating to me that you can post a recreation of a minor threat photo or, you know, Joe and Brendan are on my show to talk about how Fugazi jams sometimes. And it's like a news day. Like it's a huge news item. And I wanted your, pers- I, it's so weird. I guess I'll be about, I have to say, I think that is an indication in my mind of, well, first off the insatiable mall of the internet. Yes. And conversely, the vacuum that exists in terms of what people, the fact that that would be newsworthy always makes me think, wow, people need to find something in their yeah, lives. Yeah. Cause yeah. you know, like to me it's, but it, it's all, it's so ephemeral and it's, I find it, it's a little weird cause it doesn't seem to me those things. They're not, it's not really news. It's just life and people, but for some reason people all get excited for a second. And then I think what happens is it has a, it's a charge, and then people try to constantly get that charge back. I just don't, but I don't, I don't do social media at all, so I don't have any sense of that. I don't. No, I, 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 don't I write you. I, I write you sometimes yeah. to say, "Hey, did you see the thing?" And I feel, I know you probably want to insulate yourself, maybe even a little bit from some of this shit. But uh, yeah, it's it's a weird product of on demand culture that people right. like and, every band. Any band I want to see, if I if I demand enough, and like they'll play Coachella, like they'll get back together. Like it's sort of interesting. Yeah. Like we all yeah. just expect everything all the time. Like I'm going through with my kids. Like I didn't grow up thinking I could watch anything whenever I wanted. I had to be there, and that's right. psychologically created patience. That goes back. That kind of goes back to the: Are you a spot that moves on a map? Or are you? Are you a spot the map moves around? Yeah. And that's sort of the, it's a just similar thing, and. And not and just to be clear, I'm not a luddite, and I'm not, I'm not a crank about. It. I don't think anything's wrong. Yeah, I know. Like, you know, I don't think that it's like, and like our kids, yeah, their their experiences is is, is a it's a different reality than ours. Yeah, that doesn't mean yeah. there's nothing wrong. It just I'm not. Means that's I'm not. Reality. I don't fight yeah. it. I don't fight it. I only try to relate to it. Like I'm like yeah. Like my wife is like they can't be on the. Like we're doing virtual school because of the pandemic, right. and she's like right. they're on the screens all the time. I'm like yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. We're on the screens all the time. Like there's right. not. They're not living a separate life than we're living. Like right. So it's anyway, it's just we're all doing it right now, and maybe we won't. Uh, the same way we all. The other thing I would say about the other yeah. thing I like to say about about my threat and Discord and all that is that it's also a bubble. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you know, though it gets it raises up a little bit of dust now and then, you know, I think it's. I think it's pretty fair to say that 99.9% of the population of the world never has and never will ever know of me period or discord yeah, or in the band I've been in and they're fine. Like it doesn't make any difference. And I think that has always been in my life. That knowledge has been, it really helps me like, you know, song number one, the chorus is it's nothing. <laughs> yeah. And it's because it's nothing. It really is nothing. Like if you understand that life is an open field, then you can decide what you want life to be. And for me, I, you know, I think things are important to me, but they're important to me because I can place that value because it's really nothing. Yeah. It's just, you know, and I I say, you know, if you don't, if nothing matters then make it good. Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> like yeah. be, be kind, be yeah. well, be kind and yeah. take care of people, yeah. you know, and I always keep that in mind. So I try not, I think one of the, the problems I, I see with people who are actively get caught up in the way they're being promoted or all that kind of stuff. I feel like they, they lose sight of the reality of the situation, which is that it's nothing. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm with you on it. And, uh, and I think the pandemic stuff has put a lot of that stuff in perspective for some of us. Just like what matters, what doesn't matter, you know, like, right. Sure. Yeah. So I recently uh, was asked to appear on this fellow started a podcast called Fugazi A to Z. I don't know if you're familiar with this thing. I'm familiar with it. I haven't listened to it, but I know about yeah. it. Yeah. So he asked if I would pick a song to talk about. And I said, sure, I'll do it. And so I picked uh, Foreman's Dog as the song I wanted to discuss. And the day of the recording that we were supposed to do the interview, 
I was like, I was like, you know what? I might make some notes on this just so I, I had to clear. I just want to clarify things, but I randomly last minute wrote to Guy and Brendan to say, Hey, like, do you have any insights about this song? And it was fascinating what I got back. Uh, yeah. just the way those two work together and four track things. And, you know, Guy was like, I gave him my, my essay, <laughs> my, you know, my master's thesis analysis of the lyrics and it was fascinating for him to say, you know what? Like, I never tell people what to think about my words. That's not what we do. Uh, but you're not totally wrong. Like I mentioned, I don't know if you you remember the... Do you remember... What is your remem- memory? Sorry, I don't want to do this again. But do you have any memory of that song and, and maybe what that means to you now? Because we got on this whole... Tr- I talked about when we were kings, the documentary. I don't yeah. know. Did you watch that documentary? That's- yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's exactly where the title came from. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it's just fascinating yeah. to unpack uh, a song from 1998 and with those guys and get the insight about how they would... I didn't realize they would... Guy and Brendan spent an afternoon. You know, he, t- he told me the story. They four-tracked and demoed these songs that became Fugazi songs, which I found fascinating. That was... Now I have to say that was a rarity. I mean, Fugazi's writing was really interesting. In the beginning, obviously... It was just me and Joe. Yeah. And Joe had played bass a bit, but he wasn't, he hadn't written a lot of stuff. So the beginning of the band sounded like merchandise and bad mouth and waiting room. And, you know, a lot of those riffs, they're just, they're my riffs, basically. Yeah. I mean, Joe also started, he had some, he, he started to develop pretty great bass lines, but, you know, they're basically riffs that I had. So then when Brennan started to play with us, he, just started playing the song basically that I had written, but then Brennan started to kind of shape the songs because Brennan's an absolutely brilliant musician and he has you know, a lot of ideas. So, but Guy was not in the band in the beginning. Yeah. And then Guy started, he first time Guy really, the first song he sang was Break In. That would have been October of 87, I think our third or fourth show. And he kind of came on board as a vocalist doing some songs. Hold on. It's probably Joe. <laughs> it's actually Cynthia. Cynthia. Con- oh, weird! Con- everyone we everyone we talk about is going to phone. Their yeah, e- right. ears are burning or whatever. Right. Yeah. So, anyway, um, so I was writing. You know, we were. I had all these. So I kept writing these riffs, and then, but Brennan was sort of reshaping them, which was. I was like, wow, I kind of have to get used to that. And then, Guy was writing more and more words, and he was singing some songs, and, and then when Guy started playing guitar it really like changed the way we wrote. Yeah. And I remember coming in with some songs and like, Oh, here's the song. Here's the verse and the chorus. And the band said, well, we're not just going to play. Like we want to write the song with, we want to write the song. So then it actually, in many ways, I stopped bringing in full songs because I realized that we were as a band, we were going to write together collectively. And so we would just bring in, we would just have ideas so you bring in an idea and then you just kind of build on that idea. So that was pretty much the way it went for most of the 90s. And then in 98, Brendan and Guy came in one day with his <laughs> court. They did um, Foreman's Dog and Arpeggiator, I think. My and, God, uh, one of the greatest songs of and, my I love Arpeggiator. Sorry uh, to interrupt, uh, but I love that song. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Foreman's Dog, Arpeggiator, and um, uh, close, Turn Into Closed Caption. Closed Caption, that's right. Those are the three songs they did. And it was... I mean, they're. I mean, those guys did a, were always did a lot of recording. Mm. They there's so much music they've made together. We had a in DC we had a thing called fuck bands. Basically, mm. or at least I called it fuck bands. But it's like just things we did on the side. Oh, and yeah. they're kind of joke bands, but also they were cool. And there were some of the songs that ended up like, I mean, for instance, there was a band that I was involved with called Pea Soup, which was Joey Picuri. The sound man, Fugazi sound man. This is before Fugazi, but Joey, he, it was like a, basically a James Brown band. Oh, I mean, it was essentially James. It was James Brown song practically. <laughs> and he asked me to play bass. And I remember we, I, I went to go play a gig and I said, like, well, I don't know the songs over here. Here's a practice tape. And I was driving in the car to the gig and I put the tape in to see what, I have no idea what they were doing. And it's just nothing but James Brown songs. Oh. So when I got there, I said, oh, you gave me a wrong tape. You gave me a James Brown song. He goes, no, that's, that's your practice <laughs> tape. So, so anyway, it was like, so I just basically, so we did some recording. It was basically me and the guys from Scream yeah. and, and uh, this band called Velvet, Velvet Monkeys and just pe- 
people the different sort of a crew of people and we recorded and one of the tracks we did um i it was my riff was what turned in later into suggestion like there's a oh. version so that there was a so ideas like that like there were songs that kind of came through the sort of the fuck home bands recordings. yeah the fuck yeah, the bands fuck band. yeah, yeah, yeah yeah right that's fascinating so, so but i think in the case of brennan gee they really sat down and crafted those things and it was and it was heavy because i remember saying to them they came in i said oh so you know, we'll do this because i'm thinking right, let's take it apart and rebuild it and they're like well let's try to keep it sort of in the shape and i was like oh all right like it was like <laughs> it was a, it was an evolution in our writing um yeah but it was i mean they're such incredible songs and uh, yeah yeah and i think like closed caption and former's dog both they both kind of I think they both sort of evolved, but arpeggiator or know each other. We made closed caption stayed pretty to, true to form, but arpeggiator and form and I think we developed that. That was like sort of a band. We all, and of course, no matter what, once you start working on it together, you're going to have an influence on it, yeah. regardless whether you, you arrange, rearrange or anything. Yeah. But anyway, yeah. Form dog was, it's a, it's a, it was a tough song for us. It was not. It was one we didn't play very often. Yeah, that's what the uh, host Ian of that podcast said. I looked it up. They barely played it. I'm like, oh, okay. I didn't realize that. But uh, anyway, uh, that's kind of an aside. I, uh, I just, I love that record. It was fun. To, it was fun to talk about. It was fun to really go in deep on a Fugazi song. Oh, I like to, I like to see your essay or whatever. It is you <laughs> I think it's coming out soon. I'll send you a link. The, uh, the, the podcast anyway, if you have time. Uh, um, I want to ask you about Discord. You're there now. Uh, in the house, and I'm just curious, A, kind of what's up, what's sort of new at Discord these days? I'm also curious about your role in it and how it maybe has evolved since the label started, um, your day-to-day role, I suppose. Um, has it changed well, much? Well, the label started 40 years ago, so yes, it's evolved. <laughs> the, the four fucking decades the label's been around, yes. Um, well, sometimes people have a hands-on role at the beginning. They take a little break. Other people uh, help. I, I, I'm I, asking. I, I have a sense of it from our emails and various conversations over the years. I'm just uh, wondering. I, I think in the beginning, obviously, you know, Jeff and I, in the very beginning, you know, it was Nathan Straycheck and... Jeff and I, you know, were folding, putting the records together. And then at some point, it was mostly Jeff and I and other people, Amy Pickering and Cynthia Connolly and Eddie Janney and other people were, I mean, I just in my journals was talking about Brendan Canty coming over. I was paying him $5 an hour or something to fold and insert faith subject to change lyric sheets. Oh, you know, nice. that's, we was always, we were always making stuff here, making records at, you know, a Discord house, just literally making records. Yeah. Like, putting yeah. records together and and i'm and, and actually in this 1989 journal i am working all the time like going to the bank and going to the you know what i've referred to over i love it i always like i go to the federal express office because <laughs> pre-fedex right it was yeah. called federal express and also i mean we used to have to at that time we were getting records made overseas and they were being shipped by air and we'd have to go to dulles airport and bring them through customs it was like a four hour operation. We had to uh. pick up like thousands of records and you had to fill out all these forms. It was so much work. Yeah. So a lot of that stuff I don't do anymore. Like we don't also, we just it's sort of set up now. The way the label is set up now is physically speaking, like I'm a Discord house, which is directly across the street from the Discord office. The Discord office is in a basement underneath a 7 Eleven and a dry cleaners. Oh. We've got that space. 26 years ago okay and it's a that so that's where the distribution like for distributors and record stores and mail order all go out of there and I the see. production stuff largely is over there the accounting stuff is over there i have four people who work there at the moment and that's usually about the about the size of the crew four or five people and then i'm on this side of the street and over here we have the art stuff we have archive stuff but also a lot of things like this is part of my job doing interviews for instance i do a lot of interviews <laughs> you've done I a do, lot I answer, <laughs> right i answer the mail like i have a lot of mail i i deal with a lot of the recording stuff i have like i have like i'm working today i have work to do upstairs in the archive room i have to go through you know today don's and tara dropped off this this drive which i'm holding in my hand oh yeah it's a little thumb drive 
that has a bunch of files that I need to get into the proper folders. And um, I do, I transfer tapes up there. We, that's when we did the Fugazi Live series website. Yeah. You know, we, we have a stack of cassette decks upstairs, three of them, and then we ran three at a time and whap them into a drive. Um, or we have, we did the dads. I, mean, I, I have a, I'm constantly transferring tapes. It's just an ongoing process. So yeah. my work, I don't do mail order. I, I certainly could do it. I don't do it at this point. I don't do the ship, ships, shipping to stores. I don't do any of that work at the moment. Um, it's funny you say that because I ordered something a few years ago and I opened up from Discord and I opened it up and there was a message from you. Oh, I, I probably saw your name. Yeah, that was very sweet. I was like, wow. And, and But it did make me think, is Ian doing this? <laughs> is he, is he, is I might have been. If yeah. A few years ago, there was a period of time where I, I, you know, I cover occasionally, so I very well may have yeah, been. Yeah, it was very sweet. But I'm over there. I mean, it's when I say it's across the street, yeah. I'm talking about literally across the street. Yeah. If yeah. you come out the front door of Discord and walk straight, you walk, it's, you know, 30 feet across the street and there's the door. You go right in. Yeah. So I... I I would I go I'm always over there and you know we're always talking and it's very much like an active kind of crew of people. I do think there's something to be said for like for me it's been important to have an actual label like an operation an actual yeah. label operation yeah. not just a couple of people with laptops and a deal with somebody else to do the work. We like you know we're like today for instance one of the things we were working on we discovered that we had a return on, um, we don't sell many compact discs anymore, CDs, but there's some, you know, yeah. people buy them every now and then. Yeah. And we discovered that we, there was a return of the odds, the last even yeah. record, the odds yeah. of about 150 CDs. And as far as we can tell, all of them are defective. Oh, What's wrong? And with they're them? the last of the CDs in existence, right? Like oh. We're not going to make any more of those things, so we've been spot checking them, and it's something I've never encountered before, which is a, but all of them have some kind of, they're they've been corrupted. I don't know how or why. They're not. It's not uniform. It's not like every time track four messes up. It's you put it on, and sometimes it'll track, sometimes it won't. Sometimes it's stored on one track and not in the other. It doesn't make any sense. Never encountered it before. So we were just discussing one of the things we're working on today was seeing if we could find a place that would press up. We could do like a short run. Yeah. Because it seems a shame to throw away those covers. And also we're never going to make it again, that CD. So for the the people who want them, it would be nice to be able to provide. Yeah. I hate to throw stuff away. Right. One thing about Discord, we hate throwing stuff away. Like we have a record that we don't want to make trash. Oh, yeah. No, you know, that's a Yeah. Yeah. So that's a. That's a really, so that's, anyway, that's the kind of thing that we work so on. Every, we work on it. You're working on, you, you just working every day on that stuff. Yeah. It's, this, this pandemic, I talked to lots of people, as you may know, and this pandemic has yielded interesting uh, responses to what I construe as kind of a, a wrap up question. I always ask people, you know, what's coming up? What's new? And interestingly, in my conversations, people are using, because they can't tour in some cases, they don't have access to studios. You know, some people are trying to write songs, but a lot of them are saying, I'm finally tending to a backlog of stuff, an archive of materials that I just haven't had a chance to sit down and dig through and focus on. I feel like you are doing some semblance of those things all the time in your practice. Like you're working. I mean, I, yeah, it was not a pandemic thing for me. I've been. That's what I mean. Like this. But yeah. Yeah. Well, I can tell. I'll just tell you. In a, a, uh, 2007 or 2008 or something, um, I just sort of was thinking about my my life. And I was like, man, I've just been doing this for so long. Yeah. And I started thinking, like, maybe I should bust out. Like, maybe it's time to close up shop or something. But then I realized that upon further reflection that I live a very unusual life compared to many people. Like I own my own time and I always basically have owned my own time. And there's no question I've worked hard and I don't feel like, I don't feel lucky, you know, like in that sense. But I am fortunate in as much as that there are many people who have entrusted me and Discord Records with their music. We're talking about since 1980, December of 1980, people have let us, basically release our music 
sell records, you know, their records, never use a single contract with any of them ever. And they, it's never been a problem. They just trusted us. And I realized in thinking about that, I, at this point, though now, and this is natural, like Discord was a label that was created to document a community. A community is made up of people. People are mortal. They die. Therefore, communities die. Therefore, eventually the label dies. That's all seems mm. totally normal to me. So the label, the arc of a label, like in the mid nine, early 90s, after the Nirvana business happened and everything was selling like crazy, we you know we were selling, I mean, Fugazi records were selling hundreds of thousands of records. And now if we sell, you know, 5,000 or something, we're overjoyed. But it is clearly diminishing like it's getting to be less and less like yeah. I'm just, but i've never been goal oriented i've never thought like let's make this i'm not ex an expander i never thought like more 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 i'd never thought i thought just do the work that's in front of you so that's what i do still so at that moment i started realizing now more than ever like yeah sure i could bail out but that's not really reasonable because these people have entrusted me with their work so I've realized that I have a custodial responsibility to these people to actually, for as long as there's people that are interested in discord or interested in these bands to try to make the music available in one form or another and to tend to it, to be the caretaker that I've been, that I basically signed up to be. Yeah. And once I decide that it really became clear what I was, what I needed to do or how to go about doing it. And the, one of the things, I realized that I should do, and this is t over a decade ago, was I need to get shit organized. Now that came from another, I had a friend who died. He was young and, um, you know, he was not, well, not young, young, but he was in his thirties and um, not, didn't, did not take very good care of himself. But when he died, a mutual friend had been named executor of his will. And I said, Oh, how'd that go? Because, our friend was a mess and he is the will was pristine everything was accounted for he said it was the greatest gift anybody ever gave me yeah because one thing when you lose a friend it's nothing to lose a friend than having to be faced with a total mess right right so when i die someone's going to have to deal with this stuff and at the moment i'm the only person who really knows like everything that's in this house. Like I know why this stuff is here. So I can pull down something off a shelf that's in front of me here or from over here. And I can tell you, you know, like this roll of stickers was when we were doing DVDs, you know, like yeah, yeah. whatever, you know, that kind of shit. And I, I just, I'm the person who knows, like I know what everything yeah. is. You're the brain trust, and I guess. Yeah. When I die, somebody would have to contend with it. And that person, because I'm married to Amy Farina, she would be, next of kin and i thought i need to get stuff organized so it's not dumping it into her or anybody else's lap so that those two things really kind of became they were there was an affinity between the two ideas one was to be custodial yeah. responsible have a kind of responsibility to take that kind of to look after that stuff and then the other thing was to make sure that the my stuff it was actually organized so since then, I've organized 35 years of correspondence. I've organized thousands of flyers and worked with people. Worked, and that's just not just me. I work with other people, which is also, frankly, part of the process. Mm -hmm. I mean, I love it. I love having these experiences of learning about this. And, and, and to some degree, typing in my journals, I don't think of this as I'm not nostalgic really at all. Yeah. Like, I'm not nostalgic. I don't miss any of that, anything really. Yeah. It's not like that. It's rather... I know what it is. So I might as well put it down for people. You know, that's all I yeah. say. This is what it is. Yeah. And I think, and people seem to get something out of it. So I feel like it's, it's fair enough. Good yeah. work. So part of being cust this custodian thing, I have this responsibility is, is the label itself has to go as long as it can go. So we have moved away from speculating. Like we're not going to, like maybe this band will, you know, do something. We are just going to stick to really family type things or, you know, it's just also younger bands. It's hard. They can't really relate to our way of doing things. Oh, I see. You know, so there's not as much of a likely, likelihood that you would work with a younger band at this point. 
No, because a lot of them, a lot of the younger bands, who I think are perfectly, they're good bands, but they, you know, they have managers, which is so bizarre. <laughs> yeah. And I just not, this is not my world. I just don't deal with, I've never, I've never had a manager, mm-hmm. you know, and I, I don't never had like a hired publicist. I don't, I just don't operate like that. So it's all more power to them. But I just think that they come to us and they're like, what you guys don't what? Cause we're, but we're a punk label. So that's how we operate it. Yeah. This is a different way of doing things. Well, but anyway, this yeah. is not what you wanted to do for your interview. You blew it. No, I did not. This was exactly <laughs> what I wanted. First of all, I want to say to you that I hope you don't die. That is my number um, one thing. I, I oh, I'm gonna. I will die. No, that's you, for sure. You're not gonna it, die. It's for sure. That's part. <laughs> it's the second most natural thing in life. That's. There's no question about that. I know. I know. I'm not scared about it. I'm not worried about. It. I'm not planning on it. Okay. In the sense that I think it's going to occur soon. I'm just saying straight up, it's inevitable. And I'd rather deal with that kind of the stuff now when I can think about it than later when I can't. That's I, all. I just, as a friend, I don't want you to die. I hope you don't die. Oh, that's it. That's all I want I to say. I don't, I don't want to die. That's yeah, not my don't plan. Die. Just yeah. a, anyway, that's the first thing. Yeah. Secondly, I know from an earlier conversation we had, uh, you don't generally like talking about things that aren't done. But yeah. to wrap up, are there future plans for Discord or for yourself that you would be willing to share? Is there anything coming up that we can sort of tell people about? No. Nothing. <laughs> totally fine. I mean, I mean, we, yeah, there's things, I mean, there's things that are work, always working on things. There's always stuff happening. Uh, at the moment, everything is so screwed up by the pandemic in terms of pressing. I actually just was talking right now, even repressings, like just trying to repress the first Fugazi vinyl is six months behind we're just waiting everything is jammed up yeah so all of the new project everything is just a mess right now yeah and it's just pulling teeth in terms of getting records made so we're running into a real problem because it was an enormous amount of mail order and everything's out but we can't repress anything we have so many records on order oh. and that's just a repressing so never mind the new ones obviously amy and joe and i are you know, we never stop playing music, so we're working away. We've been writing and trying to, you know, come up with new songs. Lyrics are very slow, but we got a ton of music. Great, um, that's awesome. And so that's good. And but I'm, I'm, you know, I always just work with what's in front of me. So yeah, you know, fair, fair so at the moment. That's you know, that's what I'm doing now. And then you know, th- there's other things always. You know, there's large, endless project. I'm still trying to find the trying to finish the live series. I have 60 more shows to post. I Which thought I thought Joe was kind of doing most of that. That's you now. Or was Joe only Joe only did the f- the first thirty CDs? Oh, okay. I thought the I website. Thought, <laughs> I thought no, the website of... was really the website was uh, that was largely run out of Discord. Like we did that. You know, Guy worked on it quite a bit, and this guy Alec Bourgeois, who worked for me at Discord, worked on it. Um, but I'm the main. I'm the main person. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Joe did the, he did the 30 physical CDs, but then he moved to Italy and he was gone for eight years. Yep. So the, and the website is sort you know, I think that we launched at in 2011 or 2012. And uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So we've gotten, I think we're up to 800 and I don't know, 830 or 40 shows up now. And we have another 60 to go. Phenomenal. And that means there's only, a, I think 150 more to find. If I ever find them. Speaking of which, do you know anybody who recorded the Guelph show? The Loft show, you mean, or the yeah, nine, uh, well, the Loft. I I know, but I downloaded the version you have. Are you looking for a better copy? There is a copy in on the live series. Well, I'm always looking for anybody who knows about stuff because I think like they can find other. If they can find, I always look for people who have recordings of anything because then quite often they can find other recordings from that year, eighty nine. That's what eighty nine is our is our dark year. That's the one that we have. We have very few recordings from. I'll send a text so, to. Where did you? Uh, would you guys have recorded that show yourselves? Oh no, we got that one probably from Aaron or Phil okay. Or something that's like who that. I would. That's the only people I would right. be able to ask. But I'm saying, but, if you know of anybody who has, yeah, like we played Toronto. I think I think we may have. I'm not sure if we have that recording or not. We played at the. The Riv, maybe Rivoli. Rivoli, yeah. I yeah. was I wasn't at that show. I saw you guys at the Cool House and the Phoenix, uh, but I wasn't at that Rivoli show. It was a bit ahead of my. I was maybe right. too young or whatever, but yeah, right, uh, yeah. I uh, you don't. Anyway, I'm always looking for eighty. I'm just putting the word out that I'm looking for eighty nine record, nineteen eighty nine recordings. Those okay. Those are the shows that I can't find. Okay. Um, I'd really like, and I have another say. 
500 images to post. <laughs> Yeah, I just I, have I just so many photos to put up. I just posted because I was looking for something. I found my photos of your show at the I think it's called the Lost Horizon in Syracuse. Oh yeah, in, Ro- in Syracuse, yeah. I think so. I just found them and took a quick and endur- I took <laughs> I took pho- phone photos of my actual photos and I posted them on Instagram and and people went like bonkers. They were just so excited to see. Well, yeah, we had the one that we hadn't posted on the website. They're your photos. I sent you photos from. First of all, I'm not a photographer. I did my best with like a point. It doesn't and, matter, actually. The, quite often, the show, the photos taken by people who are not photographers, are often better. Yeah. Let me take a look here. I, I haven't. Yeah, looked, I remember that. That I, show was insane. Yeah, the, the, the Rochester. The, well, the Rochester show was insane. The the, that, lost, the Syracuse show was okay. The, the Syracuse show was not, to my memory, insane. It was great. I enjoyed it. But the Rochester show the next day, I want to say, was bonkers. Like people went nuts, and you had it out with some people. There were people there from Bath, New York, and they you were like, "It's great to be in Rochester." Like, no Bath, and you made a joke. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and then the show got more and more intense, and some of the early albums, like early Fugazi stuff, came. Guy lost it. Like I, I could tell. Like. Something shifted. It was different than the the night before. Like the mood was much different. We were all pretty tranquil, I would say, in uh, Syracuse. But Rochester was bonkers, mosh pits, and people being jerks. And I, I was don't. Was it Harrow East? Was it that show with blonde redhead? That show? Yeah, yeah. The, I saw five Fugazi shows in '98. So yeah, all I, right. I don't remember all the venues, but I saw Chicago. Oh Detroit. yeah, I, like, I would like to have the. Can you do you have those photos? Yeah, yeah, I can send them to you again. I think I did mail them to you because you sent me. I'll a, make sure. Yeah, I'll send them again. I'll scan them or something. I know I must have. They might be one, some of the stuff that I've, I'm sitting on. Hold on a second. Let me take a quick sure, look. Sure, sure. Could I have? That's exactly. This is exactly the kind of stuff that I'm working on. Okay. Like I'm just trying to get. Uh, again, I don't. I didn't shoot at anything at Rochester. My last, the Syracuse show. I think. I think that's right. Wait, which one? Maybe I'm wrong. I think it's Syracuse I, is a smaller club. And Rochester it was, was yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Now I'm I can't remember shit. I will send you I'll send you scans because I just came across uh, those photos. I can send them again if you want. I think you I think you have. I don't think you. If you send them to me, I don't have them marked, which is un, very much unlike me. Um, you sent me a postcard thanking me for all of the stuff I sent, but I will send them. Right. A, I'll send them again. Don't worry, it's fine. They weren't like great. I wasn't expecting much. I still remember I gave uh, Steve Albini the photos from the Chicago show that remember the Congress Theater show in 98. I saw I saw Shellac in Vancouver in 99. And I, you know, very meekly was like, I took these photos of your show in Chicago. And he was like, yeah, great. We don't really we don't really like carrying around the photos. (laughs) He was like, we're on tour here, man. Like, people give us stuff. It's kind of a pain. He was nice about it, but, you know, I felt kind of sheepish about giving him these photos. But you, anytime I've ever sent you any archive print newspaper thing I've done about yeah. you, you always take the time to send me a nice uh, postcard. And I always, uh, or a, a I, mean, I have a million billion fucking photos. I have so yeah. many, I love having photos. It's weird. I can't find any photos from you, which is bizarre that I can't find any. I would. I always credit photos. Yeah. Did you mail? Literally mail? I snail. I snail mail them to you. I'm fairly certain because you sent me a postcard. But it's fine. We can deal. What with, year was it? Like well, I probably. I, I probably. Actually, I probably did it. Well, I, I wouldn't have thought to do it in 1998. I probably did it when we started corresponding sometime this century. But I don't remember. Um, in any case, I'll send them to you. you send me, or just send me even the pictures from the. I, if you can, you know, scan them. That's all. I just want to. Yeah. It's weird that I can't find them. No, it's I'll bizarre. scan them. I'll scan them. Don't worry about it. I'll scan them for sure. Um, two it's re- funny. That you're, my re- recollection is that Lost Horizon show was just jammed, and it was like people were just going nuts. It was so. Well, and I, then the, I hope I don't. The Harold Ballroom show was big. It was bigger, but I don't remember it being as intensive. But maybe I'm just maybe I'm thinking about it differently. Well, I do know from the photos I took that I wasn't being jostled around, and I got up close and. I my memory that is would probably be Harrow. It's a higher stage. Lost Horizon was low, like as I, as I recall, it's the, a smaller. The, the yeah. photos I took are of a smaller place. I will send them oh, to yeah. you. We, you and I, will figure this out together, and it'll right. be fine. I want to go out on a Kariki song, if you don't mind, because oh, I sure. I love that record and Thanks. it came out uh, this year, and 
It seems fitting to me. Is it possible for you, because I don't have it in front of me, by the way, I noticed Eddie Vedder was on the Howard Stern show. Did anyone tell you about this? He had a very prom- oh, yeah, someone, yeah, prominently yeah. displayed copy of... The- that was very, very nice of him. Yeah, yeah, I have it here too. But uh, sorry, do you mind picking a song for us to go out on from the record? Oh, uh, what song? I don't know. What song do you like? Yeah, what song knew, do you like? I, I knew you were going to do this to me. Put on Say Yes. I like that, Jim. That's a good song. Say Yes. Okay. Anything you want to say about it per se? <laughs> oh, you asked me to pick a song. You know. <laughs> what do you like about it? Why did that one come to mind? Oh, it's Amy, it's a great song. I thought Amy wrote great words and she sings great on it. It's a cool, it's an unusual song. Is this the one? I don't know. There's some really great drumming, if I might say, on this record. I And some very interesting beats that I, I'm a drummer and I was like, man, I can't even, I'm going to go down to the basement and try to figure this out. But she's something else. Yeah, she's something else. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, this is Say yeah. Yes by Kariki. Uh, Ian, thank you so much for uh, making time for me, and congratulations on 40 years of Discord, and uh, and please don't just, die. Oh, I'm not planning on dying. And all you got to do, I mean, really, the only trick is just to wake up every day, and that goes for being alive or having a record label for four decades. <laughs> it's true. You know, but, you know, don't you don't have to just, you know, people say, like, you know, you know, are you, what's your, like, your, are you guys celebrating? But no, I mean, we're just, we celebrate by working. We yeah. just do the work. I feel similar and from my modest perch. So all this to say, it means a lot to see you and talk to you. Thank you, Ian, and best of luck with everything in the future. Nice to see you. Good luck. Hope this, hope we covered some of the ground you wanted to cover. <laughs> we did. We did for right, sure. We'll talk again. very nice to have uh, a man I admire greatly and uh, and have for for most of my life Ian Mackay Ian Mackay back on uh, creative control thank you Ian very much for your time and uh, in this case Ian uh, appeared on the 583rd episode of creative control which is part of the entertainment one podcast network and is available everywhere you get your podcasts all of the companies Apple Google Spotify all of those things it's it's on all of those things If you can't find an episode that you've heard about and you're looking for, 
Or if you want to learn more about me and sign up for my regularly scheduled newsletter, please visit my website, vishkana.com. You can like uh, the Creative Control page on Facebook or follow the show on Twitter at Vish Creative or follow me directly at Vishkana. You can also follow me on, on Instagram at Vishkana. Actually, I recently, as, I, as I'm speaking to you, as you're hearing this, I don't know what recently means to you, but I did, as I'm speaking, <laughs> recently post some photos from the State Theater show in Detroit uh, that where I saw Fugazi. It was on uh, May 9th, 1998. So I scanned some of those photos to send to uh, Ian as he requested. And then, uh, yeah, I posted a few of them. So if you want to see what we were talking about, head over to my Instagram, at Bishkana. Also visit patreon.com slash creative control to make a flexible monthly donation uh, to keep this podcast going. Six dollars or more uh, lets you access some exclusive audio content. And it's mostly stuff from my past audio, uh, you know, my audio archives. I've done a lot of interviews over the last 20 years and uh, I don't want them to be lost to history. So sometimes I share them and that seems to be the most practical way to do it. Not part of this podcast, but somewhere there's somewhere. So yeah, six dollars or more gets you uh, access to that, and you can cancel anytime or adjust your donation uh, anytime. So consider doing that. There is actually a, an episode featuring all members of Fugazi giving me uh, advice about uh, my wife and I putting our old Mish Vish interracial morning show, college radio show, on hiatus in anticipation of uh, having our son. Uh, so back in 2011. So. Man, this relationship with Fugazi goes back a long time, and they've always been very kind to me, and uh, it means the world to me. So yeah, it's kind of a fun one. We I got them all on the phone individually to give me some some advice, Ian included, obviously. So anyway, yeah, patreon.com slash creative control if you want to check that out. Uh, thanks again to liveamassiehall.com, where you can watch beautifully captured concerts by some uh, excellent Canadian artists. Also, Pizza Trocadero, The Bookshelf and Planet Bean Coffee in Guelph, and Granddad's Donuts in Hamilton. They all provide in-kind support for this show. Also, my friend Jim Guthrie does uh, something similar, and you can learn more about Jim and his excellent music at jimguthrie.org. And finally, thank you for listening to this episode with Ian McKay. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you uh, might consider checking out other episodes in the back catalog. There's obviously a lot. What is? What did I say this was? 583. So there's 582 episodes at your disposal there. So, uh... If you want, check it out. Also, feel free to follow or subscribe to the show and keep up with it uh, because that helps too. If you like what you're hearing and and I like you, then it's all going to work out as well. It doesn't matter if I like you. It's a one-sided relationship. Anyway, I'm babbling as I tend to do. Thank you for listening to this and spreading the word about the show, and I will talk to you very soon. Bye for now.